William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Distemper is a human failing, but don't ever try blowing the lid of your coffin. You'll only frustrate yourself. A national broadcasting company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. A long-legged blonde follows you to the ends of the earth. Don't always feel flattered, friend. She might only be tailing you. Such was my case on the public streets one sultry summer's evening. A doll panting after me, but keeping a discreet 50 or so yards between us. I got a look at her face without turning around. How? A gimmick standard with cops. A pocket mirror held in front of me. My pursuer was good looking, with twin dimples in her cheeks and an aristocratic hook to her eyebrows. I let her follow me into a cocktail lounge. Inside, I watched her fidget at the far end of the mahogany bar for a couple of minutes. When the sweat began to spoil her makeup, I joined her. Hello. Look, you're wrong if you... Uh, if I confuse you with a pickup, I don't. Well, then... Cry wolf if I'm wrong, but I get the impression we've been inseparable for hours. Inseparable? I left my office at 3.45. I've been east, north, south, and west, and now it's 5.15. In all that time, the shadow I threw was you. Well? No, you're right. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but follow you. I'm your dream man? I meant nothing personal. Oh, that deflates me. If I can explain. Do. At 3.45, outside your office building, I didn't dare come up. Why not? I discovered that I myself was being followed. Oh. You were strongly recommended to me. As a confidential investigator, I could trust implicitly. To whom do I owe that bouquet? Never mind. I followed you, hoping we could eventually talk somewhere without being observed. Like this. What makes you think we're alone with each other now? What makes... You mean the person following me? I do mean. I haven't seen him for the last hour. Shadows don't generally quit, any more than you did. Now, look around. He's not in here. Describe him. No. Unusually small man with an enormous head, totally bald. He wore an odd candy-striped suit. You're describing a freak. He did look freakish, yes. Tell me, lady, uh, how do you uh, uh, feel generally? I'm quite sane, believe me. Which brings us to your problem. Well, it's more precisely my husband's problem. Well, introduce yourself. Vera Baxter. My husband is J.C. Baxter. You say that like J.C. Baxter is a muckamuck. My husband is someone substantial. Rich, upper class, a figure in the business world? All of those things, yes. He hasn't been himself for months. He's morose, secretive. He can't eat, he can't sleep. I believe my husband is submitting to blackmail. Does uh, J.C. know you're aware of his situation? No, he doesn't know. He's always been violent on the subject of his own privacy, his own private affairs. Mr. Craig, I'm frightened for him. And for myself. Then you want me to pinpoint what it is that has your husband in the toils? Yes, watch him. Follow him if need be. See who the persons are who telephone and molest him and... Uh, and? If humanly possible, help my husband out of his predicament. Don't you maybe mean if morally possible? A fellow yielding to blackmail, he's generally a little dirty himself. I played tail on the monkey to J.C. Baxter for 36 hours. On foot and by automobile. J.C. leading the parade in an expensive custom job hardtop. And me rattling behind him in a jalopy no self-respecting junkie would even buy for salvage. 
I knew the trip wasn't just a waste of gas by the route J.C. was taking. All back roads and the fringe areas where the city began to look like the Sahara Desert. I watched him slow up crossing a small bridge. I could guess what J.C. was up to on the bridge even before I saw the parcel go sailing over the bridge rail. I let him speed off before I stopped. A familiar payoff pattern. Money thrown into a specified area. A blackmailer wanted dough, but didn't want to be identified taking it. I went to see how much was in the parcel. From the weight to the parcel, there was plenty. Plenty was an understatement. I only needed to look to estimate the payoff at $10,000. No bill bigger than a 20. I restored the parcel. The anonymous caller would find it in the bushes below the bridge. He'd find the dough and he'd also find me. The moon was out and the cricket serenade was going full key when somebody came looking for the money. A little guy, not too much taller than the reeds. And a big round head to him, the size of a circus balloon. When he finally found the parcel, I found him flush on the jaw. <laughs> he came to with his balloon head noticeably deflated. He had a complaint. Oh, I'm bleeding from the ear. And I'm bleeding from the heart. Hey, what'd you want to go and hit me for? I get uncontrollable fits of violence. Well, I... Hey, who are you? A cop. Your name? Lou. Lou what? Too hard to pronounce. Make a try at it. Zyma Particus. Zyma Part. Oh, we'll settle for Lou. Yeah, I figured you would. Now, tell me why J.C. Baxter thinks your silence is worth $10,000 to him. Why J.C. who is what? The ten grand you had your fat little hands on in this parcel. Why do you rate it? Uh, let me take this slow, huh? You're telling me there's $10,000 real money in that bundle? I am. And that it's coming to me? You had possession of it when I conked you. Well, sure, sure, I had it all right. There's no doubt as to that. Only I thought it was just uh, some old paper. Work up an act, you'll only promote yourself into bleeding all over. Mister, let me tell you, I only came down here looking for old newspaper. What for? For the frogs. So I could make a bundle when I catch him. Catch frogs? You see. Uh, you see over there by the pond? So? Frogs. When the moon is full like now, there's millions of frogs. Here, see this flashlight I got on me? What about it? Well, I sneak over to the bank there and I shine the flashlight right in their eye. It hypnotizes the frogs. All I have to do is pick them up and wrap them. Now, what do you want with frogs? The Valencia Laboratory over on Mercer Boulevard. You know the medical students? I get a quarter for every frog. That's your story? Yeah, so you see, you, you got a case of mistaken indemnity. You don't want to lose um, Zy... Zy... Hepaticus. Thanks. <laughs> My own name had me. <laughs> yeah, we can fix that. How's that? Shorten it. Shorten it to a number. Let's go. Irregardless, I'm pinched, huh? Irregardless. Come on. The frogs won't miss you. Riding back to town with my frogman in custody, my jalopy began to shake as if age and abuse had finally gotten him. Hey, the heat shimmying from side to side. Yeah, the wheels are wobbling front and rear, like, uh... Old age. Like all the bolts have worked loose. Hey, come on, stop before we turn over. You said arrest me. You didn't say kill me. The bolts had come loose, all right. Uh, any minute, you'd have lost four wheels. Yeah, but not from natural causes, Buster. Not? Human hands did this. While I was down in the reeds, pollywogging with you. Or, hey, why would somebody want... The answer to that's in the car now approaching. You want to bet? The guy behind the wheel with a big beak pushing through a handkerchief he wore as a mask. The play was his. Who wanted to argue with a gun? Hey, you there, shorty. 
Me? Yeah, you. Climb into my boat. Me switch cars? You're rescued by the boss, is it? You talking one ear comes out the other. Right now, I don't know what you're talking about. Sure. You only know from frogs, liar. So long now. Now you, big stuff. That presumably is me. Give me a lip, I'll plug you. I'm speechless. All right, hand over the parcel. Parcel? Oh, yeah, the parcel, here. Parcel at the back window. Okay, you've got it. The contents are intact? Check with your stool. I'm asking you. I held out a dime. You want it? <laughs> no, you keep it as a tip. That incline over there, you see it? Yeah, I see it. Well, start climbing it. What for? Exercise. Be glad I'm leaving you in shape to climb. Watch me go. He watched me go, and then I watched him go. No rear license plate I could read. He had black tape over it. I was up against pretty resourceful competition. That much was very plain. When I finally escaped from my country exile, I organized a progress chat with my client, Mrs. Vera Baxter, in an apple orchard. They lived like that, the Lucky Baxters. A big house in an apple orchard where the goldfish pond left off. That it's true. My husband is being blackmailed. He's dancing to a handsome tune. 10,000 so far, I can vouch for him. That's my nightmare realized. The leg man in the situation is a midget with a watermelon for a dome. The man I saw following me. The same, undoubtedly. The gent ordering him around is self-conscious about his kisser. Covers it up with a handkerchief. But I caught one facial detail. His nose. It's a pelican beak. That mean anything? No, nothing. I've never seen anyone my husband's in negotiation with. Just what I told you. Just letters, whispering telephone calls, and mysterious conferences in the garage. Yes, that's right. Mrs. Baxter. Yes, Mr. Cray? I'm Stiley. I've only got one next approach. What? Your husband, J.C. himself. Grab the dog by the tail. I've got to talk directly at him. Oh, no, please. Oh, without involving you. He won't know you brought me into it. What will you say? One artful dodge or another. I've got a lot of experience at being noncommittal. Well? All right, if you think you must. I, I have to get back to the house now. I'll wait ten minutes and then ring the doorbell. <laughs> J.C. looked as morose as a guy could get and still want to live. Face tight, every muscle in place. Very close to the screaming Mimi. I find your visit a little fantastic, Mr. Craig. In my business, the fantastic is everyday stuff. But to single me out, why? How is what you really want to ask. How I found my way to you. I'll only tell you what I have so far. Let your imagination fill in the rest. You're paying hush money. You threw 10000 over the rail at Ramapo Bridge. Now, confide in me. I'll mind my own business, and I'll thank you to mind yours. For your own sake, Baxter, any rap is worth facing up to when the alternative is giving in to blackmail. Blackmailers keep coming back again and again. You won't have a dime left or a shred of self-respect. My advice is, open up and get done with it. I dared what you suggest. I, I wouldn't have a shred of reputation. You lick your wounds, take your lumps, and start all over again. Life's a long time. You can fall down and get up. Now, who's blackmailing you and why? I have nothing to say to you. Okay, then. I'll go. Uh, I'm in a puzzle to stay, Baxter. I can be delayed, but I can't be stopped. I'll be back with the answers one day. Bet on it, Baxter. Oh, wait. Now, you're smart to get it off your chest. Strict confidence. Sorry. I can't make blind promises. I was abroad three months ago. I became involved with a young lady, a young lady tourist. Oh, platonically, mind you. Nothing compromising. We were only companions. Go on. There were talks. I was lonely. There were dinners and walks on the promenade. Visits to museums, the tulip fields in Amsterdam. Just a harmless diversion. But the young lady tourist made more of it, huh? She distorted our situation. 
I've been receiving letters here at home, demands for heart balm, redress. Her broken heart. I'd misrepresented my status. I had not told her I was already married. No foundation to any of her claims? All lies, a blatant fakery. I was only an escort, a friend. Why are you paying blackmail? To prevent scandal, to forestall any needless hurt to Vera, my wife. You feel that vulnerable, to pay tribute to a lie? My social and business situation is sensitive. My colleagues, all of them, blue noses, very provincial. With the merest breath of notoriety. And also, my wife is a woman of certain delicacy of spirit. A perverse sense of pride and propriety. I could never make her understand. Vera would turn against me. You see my trap. I see it all right, only I'm not so sure I believe it. You don't believe me. A man your size in the world, Baxter, top dog, a high social level, a howling business success. You don't figure to be stupid enough to yield to a blackmail built on a tissue of lies. No, I don't think I believe you. That's very arbitrary of you. Whatever's got you playing obliging sucker is motivated by something a lot more potent than an old-fashioned badger game. Now, this girl, what's her name? I'll not disclose that to you. And you won't either disclose what she's really got on you. She and company, that is. I've already told you all there is to tell. You fed me a line of bunk. I'm sure you can find your way out. Yeah, out and right back in. Watch for me. I'll be back to tell you some of the things you've left unsaid. Goodbye now. In due time, I got to identify Baxter's young lady tourist. It wasn't too tough. I accomplished same at the customs desk of the International Airport. The passenger list of the plane Baxter had returned from abroad in three months before. Only one of the passengers qualified for the description of young lady tourist. Paula Wiley, age 23, residence Manhattan, New York, 216 Marlborough Heights. I found Paula at home, at home and about to decamp, dressed to go out, and two suitcases at the door. Who did you say you were? Barry Craig, my credentials. Police? Private investigator. I bring you greetings from J.C. Baxter. Oh, you're not going to deny knowing J.C. How is Mr. Baxter? Oh, he's got an ulcer growing in all directions. Where were you going? Uh, away. The, uh, the Adirondacks. I have a summer job. Nice ad lib. I suppose I should resent your talking. Oh, but you can't. Guilt's all over you like prickly sores. I'll give you a choice. Choice? Talk to me here or let's do it at the tombs. The chairs are more comfortable here. Uh, what am I being accused of? blackmailing J.C. Baxter. He complained to you? Uh, how else would I be here? Why, the dirty, underhanded... Uh-uh. Now, try to live up to your ladylike looks. What did Baxter tell you? All kinds of things. Oh, it's still inconceivable to me that it dare. Dare send me after you? Yes. You did say he engaged you. Well, call him up and ask him. Confirm it. Be smart, baby. Hang Baxter with his own noose. What's Baxter trying to scare you out of? I'm not sure you're not handing me a line. A, a come on. Oh, take the gamble. You're gambling anyhow. Blackmail has its risks. I take you on good faith. You won't get rich. I'm resigned to being poor. Baxter, I was with him in Amsterdam, Holland, the Diamond Center. We were picnicking and taking color pictures of the tulip fields. But Baxter was there for another purpose. Buying up diamonds. Industrial diamonds. He didn't know that I knew what he was doing. You looked beautiful and dumb. You can guess the rest. Baxter never declared the diamonds at customs. He smuggled them into the United States. Yes. And that's the real blackmail gimmick. Yes. Now, the uh, two gentlemen sharing your gold mine, who are they? Why must you know that? Well, I like to know all the company I keep. Ben Stacy. He's a sort of boyfriend. He handled all the contacts with Baxter. I never personally appeared in the situation. Well, uh, where does Stacy hang his hat? Down the block, the Baker Apartments. And uh, who is the little fellow with the pumpkin head? Lou. Stacy uses Lou for odd jobs. 
And other times? Lou works in the Imperial Bowling Alley. He's a pin boy. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, here. For you. Hmm. Money. Five hundred dollars. There'll be more for you another time. Oh, the things I could do with five hundred bucks. You're not going to refuse it. Take it, I'd lose my license. Let alone my self-respect. Oh. Then you're a cop after all. You're disillusioned? No, I half expected an outcome like this. But I took the gamble. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Yes? My heart's never been in the thing with Baxter. You see, it's my uh, maiden debut in crime. You're lucky. Lucky? Lucky to be caught first time out. It could prevent your becoming a habitual criminal. Let's go, huh? With Paula in custody, I looked up Ben Stacy at the Baker Apartments. No answer to the door buzzer. A formal entrance doesn't pan out, you try an informal one, which I did. I found Ben Stacy receiving at home. He was in. He'd just been playing possum. Dead possum, that is. On the floor, flat on his back, face up and his eyes blind. The manner of death required no guesswork. He had a hole on the side of his skull the size of a quarter, a bullet hole. It was an ornamental touch to the corpse, a square of gold glittering close by his shoe top. A gold cufflink, not Stacy's. Stacy wasn't wearing French cuffs. The murderer's cufflink, apparently. It lay there like it had been lost in the struggle between killer and victim. It took less than 60 seconds to find the $10,000 Stacy had relieved me of on the highway. It lay on a bureau top, exposed to the casual eye. I had two brief calls to make, out of respect to the dead, the morgue and homicide. In the tombs, Paula wept for the dead. I got Stacy into this. It's my fault he's dead. You cry like he meant something to you. I was, in a way, in, in love with him. Did you maybe, in a way, kill him? Kill? What possible reason? Eliminate a partner. It happens, doll, among the best of thieves. You were going away when I caught you. Get out of here. You get out of here. In the Imperial Bowling Alley, the balloon-headed stooge Lou looked like he only wished he'd lived a clean life. I can't leave here till 6 p.m., mister. The short of pin boys. Very sad. So come around and see me then, huh? So a morning band on your sleeve, Lou. Huh? Hey, somebody died? Yeah. You're once in a wild boss. Stacy? Stacy. Uh, what'd you want to go and tell me for? You'd rather I hadn't? Now I won't be able to keep my mind on the pins. Hmm, better that way. Now you can concentrate on your troubles. Troubles? You're fingering me for the Stacy killing? You're a suspect, chum. Please join me. Uh, oh, wait till I set up the alley. And lend a hand there on number four, huh? Like I told you, they're short-handed today. In a more fragrant setting by the shade of ye old apple tree, Mrs. Vera Baxter clutched her heart. Murder? Murder it is. You've really got a domestic nightmare now. Oh, no, you can't let your suspicions... I can't exclude your husband as a suspect... He had a pretty impressive motive against Stacy. But he's incapable. He's a gentleman. An ungentle crook. A crook? Smuggler, I should have said. But the characterization of your mister doesn't really surprise you. No. No, it doesn't surprise now. Last night in my husband's study, I pried open a drawer. What did you find? Diamonds. A bag full of diamonds. Diamonds he bought in Amsterdam and smuggled across. Your husband had a little racket going for himself. It's incredible to think that he'd stoop to... To profit? The truth out in the open, that's what you hired me for. <laughs> yes, the truth. I don't know how to live in fear. I, uh, I now show you a gold cufflink, this one. Can you identify it? Well? Uh, I'm not sure. Your eyes tell me you are sure. No good trying to evade, Mrs. Baxter. 
It's a link to a set I gave my husband. I had them specially designed at our jewelers. I, I feel faint. Yeah, who wouldn't feel? What does the cuff link mean, Mr. Craig? I can't say positively, but uh, it could mean the chair for J.C. Baxter. Oh, no. While the DA's office figured out which of the three was eligible for electrocution, Baxter, Paul, or Lou, Mrs. Vera Baxter decided to be the best wife a husband ever had. She was in my office in the bright and early a.m. My husband couldn't have murdered this man, Stacy. Why not? I believe the word is alibi. You can alibi his time? I can. Jay was at home with me all that day and evening. Well, that's a sudden thought. I was too upset to even think yesterday. You wouldn't be telling a big lie. I'll swear to what I say. Jay couldn't have done this murder. Funny thing, I'm inclined to agree with you. I've been doing some clear thinking myself. You don't need to alibi him to save him. A nice try and a nice lie, but unnecessary as it happens. No, your husband couldn't have done the murder. Neither could the other pair. Not the other pair? Paula or Lou. You see, while the corpse lay on the floor, the 10,000 lay on the bureau, where I found it. I don't follow your reasoning. Neither Paula or Lou would eliminate Stacy and overlook the loot. Only the loot could be their motive to kill. Cut Stacy out, grab everything. And if your husband killed Stacy to stop blackmail, he would cart the $10,000 away. Not only to recover his money, but to provide a red herring. Make it look like a job done by Paula or Lou. I'm glad you're exonerating my husband, but if you also eliminate the others, then who? I boil it down to one last suspect. You. Me? Uh-huh. You murdering Stacy to implicate your husband. Your revenge. What revenge would I want? Revenge for infidelity. You all along thought your husband was paying blackmail to conceal an indiscretion. You didn't know until last night that his actual crime was smuggling. Not philandering with Paula, but smuggling. I'm afraid you played some kind of a crazy joke on yourself, lady. I don't know what to say. Oh, don't say anything. Think for a long time. And when you're through thinking, make a simple confession, huh? You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Murder by Error, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of Death's Little Helper, about which Barry Craig has this to say. We call next week's story Death's Little Helper. It deals with a beautiful girl and a couple of highly unbeautiful corpses and winds up when a killer realizes that death doesn't need any help. Good night, folks. See you next week. National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production. William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Gene Bates, Julie Bennett, Herb Vigran, Hal Gerard, and Herb Ellis. Eddie King speaking. Here tonight's exciting Dragnet Adventure on the NBC Radio Network.